I'm Alicia Hyatt, Editor-in-Chief of The Northern Miner, and I'm here today with UConn Premier Sandy Silver. Premier Silver, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Let's start with the obvious. The UConn has incredible mineral wealth, uh, but not many uh, operating mines at the moment. At the same time, we have burgeoning demand for, for critical minerals coming up. Um, so where do you see the Yukon fitting into this picture? It's a really good question. Uh, I mean, our whole history is based upon uh, mining since the gold rush in my riding of uh, Dawson City and the Klondike. Um, and through the years, uh, the efforts of prospectors and, uh, and explorers, uh, we've identified in Yukon uh, 2,900 uh, different mineral occurrences. So whether it's uh, from the current mines, we're mining gold, we're mining uh, copper and, and, uh, and silver right now, but the potential with the critical minerals is, uh, is amazing. Uh, it, the Yukon is very well endowed in a lot of different areas, and as the federal government uh, is moving to invest in critical mineral strategy as well, first in Canada history for a federal government, uh, Yukon is really poised to uh, not only, um, you know, learning from uh, past practices, um, but uh, moving forward into this new direction. Uh, I, I, I can't see another jurisdiction better suited, uh, especially when you take a look at our relationships with First Nations governments. Uh, we've always uh, believed that uh, the environment and the economy have to be mentioned in the same conversation together, and by having First Nations governments at that table as well, it really does ensure that uh, seven generations of, uh, of Yukon and families are being considered in everything that we do. So uh, whether it's just our mineral wealth or our strong government-to-government -government relations, um, you know, we are, we are absolutely poised to, uh, to seize the opportunity to move forward into a, a new era of mining. Speaking of the budget, the budget included a big investment for the first time in critical minerals, um, including mining and exploration. Um, as a premier of, of a northern jurisdiction that has some challenges with infrastructure and costs, um, I was just wondering how you received that budget and whether there was anything in particular that excited you about it. Well, I think that I think it's three point nine billion dollars uh, that the federal government is putting uh, aside for the implementation of Canada's first uh, critical mineral strategy. We're very keen to work with Canada uh, to ensure that we uh, are well suited to uh, to move forward in that direction. Um, we're, we believe we'll we'll play a very significant role uh, in uh, in the search for a source for critical minerals um, you know, that is needed for everyone to transition into a, a more green economy. Um, we've had other partnerships with the federal government, uh, roads to resources, uh, a half a billion dollars there to uh, provide the infrastructure uh, necessary to get into into mining areas. I mean, you could take a look uh, at the uh, just at the history of Yukon. A lot of our infrastructure was built f in the pursuit of mining. Uh, so as the federal government turns a page and starts looking towards uh, uh, investing in the materials needed for uh, uh, electricity of, electri of uh, vehicles and houses, um, those minerals to come from a supply chain inside of Canada. I know Ontario is doing some great things in uh, battery technology as well. Uh, to close that loop to a Canadian-made uh, component with those minerals, I think it's extremely important, especially in an area like Yukon that has such a good geopolitical uh, consideration. Was there anything missing in the budget that you would have liked to have seen? Uh, well, I think that, uh, you know, with the international conflict that's happening right now in Ukraine, um, the mention of, uh, of Arctic security is on everybody's mind. Uh, we spoke with the federal minister of, uh, of uh, well, we spoke with several different ministers, including Minister Anen uh, and uh, the, the deputy prime minister as well. Um, talking about how um, maybe there wasn't anything specific in the budget on uh, Arctic security, uh, but that other foot shall drop at, uh, too, too quick before the considerations for the budget uh, to have those specifics on those different line items. As the Minister of Finance as well, I can understand that. You go through a lot of variance reports and uh, before as you develop a budget. So um, I believe there's a commitment to, uh, to uh, Arctic security and uh, you know, a federal government has a responsibility for the military side of that, whereas the territorial governments uh, and the First Nations governments working in partnership for making sure that we have resilient communities. You know, uh, you know, every Canadian should have the equal access to health care. Uh, every uh, Canadian should have the equal access to education. Uh, so having a strong Arctic community, whether we're looking at climate change uh, and all of the different uh, Northwest passages that are opening up in the north, uh, or if we're looking at international conflict and looking at security, the best thing that the Canadian government can do to help us is to fund resilient, strong uh, First Nations and Northern communities. 
So the Yukon moved into the top 10 of the Fraser Institute's Mining Jurisdiction Survey this year. It now ranks ninth globally, uh, moving from the number 18 spot last year, um, and number three in Canada for investment. So how do you plan on staying in the top 10? We, we're uh, great to see the Fraser Institute recognize uh, the work that we've been doing um, uh, over the long term uh, of working with Indigenous uh, governments uh, and also working on a process uh, to review our uh, economic, uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, status boards, uh, YESIP, uh, the process uh, to ensure that the system uh, can adjust well. So we're, we're, we're happy uh, to see that the respondents uh, um, indicated that they've seen a decrease in concerns in Yukon's environmental regulations and the socio-economic uh, um, uh, concerns, um, and also a decrease in, in uh, oh, an, an increase in certainty uh, when it comes to um, uh, working together uh, on the geopolitical side of things. But we know that we still have a lot more to do. Uh, so there is a yes of reset, uh, so there's a new table uh, with the board uh, for, uh, for these pursuits um, and just making sure that we can continue to adjust to society's needs as we move into the next uh, phase of mining, including critical minerals, uh, lining up with the, uh, the intent of the federal government uh, and also making sure that we can streamline the system as well as possible. I will say as well that the best thing that uh, what I've seen in my, uh, you know, 11 years in politics now, um, you know, working hand in glove with First Nations governments, um, you know, coming to them first uh, and then coming to us, uh, it really does help in that process. You know, uh, when public comment comes in to see a company uh, that uh, a company like Victoria Gold, um, you know, a company like uh, uh, Minto or Alexo, Alexco, um, you know, just being good corporate citizens really goes a long way uh, in the regulatory system as well. You know, um, what we have in Yukon is uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the mining. Uh, jobs, whether they're the contracts or subcontracts, uh, exploration, uh, prospectors, uh, all the way through to production. A lot of Yukon uh, content, uh, a lot of in Indigenous content as well, uh, which really, really bodes well uh, for the Fraser Institute recognizing the, uh, the work that we've done, uh, but also now, if, as we continue to move forward, uh, we need to keep the yes at reset uh, moving forward, uh, working with all of our partners to ensure that uh, we keep in the, uh, in the, in the good, uh, good side of the top ten. Can you tell me a little bit more about that reset of YESAB? Uh, and uh, as you know, there have been uh, concerns uh, of that I'm sure you're trying to address about, uh, about the timelines and um, missing uh, uh, legislated timelines. Um, so can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so the, uh, the YESA Oversight Group is one of the uh, systems that's tasked with this work. Um, it's, uh, it's a joint effort between the Government of Canada, uh, the Government of Yukon, and also First Nations uh, governments as well, all working together to try to find efficiencies uh, and to improve the YESA uh, process. And, uh, and in part of that mandate, uh, the Oversight Group is considering changes uh, to the uh, Environmental Socioeconomic Assessment Act. and maybe it's some of its regulations as well in, in an effort to reduce some unnecessary uh, um, adjustments or uh, unnecessary assessments mm -hmm. um, you know the things that are, are are redos you know that haven't changed much uh, you know being able to uh, to move quicker through through a system um, that that would allow um, you know, a company to, if they've already gone through an environmental process years ago and nothing has changed, then we don't have to start from ground zero again, mm -hmm. those types of things. Um, so work is advancing with this group right now, and uh, we hope to see additional progress in the near future, too. Your government has started a process to modernize the Mining Act in the Yukon. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Hand in glove, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, for those who know legislation in the north, um, you know, we did uh, paralleled, uh, you know, uh, legislation in the times of devolution, and the plan is always to get to successor legislation, whether it be in uh, land, uh, forestry, uh, or mining. Uh, and so we're, we've been working uh, in the last uh, year uh, with Indigenous governments and federal government as well on the uh, on, the, on this process, um, it's it's modernizing, right? I mean, it's uh, taking a look at p placer and quartz mining and seeing if there's double standards inside of there or how we can work through efficiencies. Um, taking a look at what we've done and, and making sure that the mining uh, companies and uh, the prospectors and, and the folks in Yukon that have dedicated their lives to this industry are part of that modernized uh, uh, process as well. So um, it's, it's really good to have that. Uh, it was a commitment that uh, the territory made to the 
federal government years ago, and so we're honoring that commitment. And can you tell us a little bit more about First Nations involvement in that process? Well, so in, uh, in Yukon, we have uh, 14 First Nations, uh, 11 of them uh, are, have modern uh, self-governing agreements and, uh, and three still uh, manage their affairs through the Indian Act. Um, we have uh, government to government relations with each of these nations uh, and we work collaboratively in an overlap of a lot of different areas. Um, we just changed uh, our procurement models uh, so that we have a First Nations procurement model. Mm -hmm. um, we're changing education. We now have uh, education boards that are uh, driven by First Nations communities. And also, uh, we signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with First Nations governments uh, in our first year uh, of, uh, of government. Um, all extremely important uh, conversations, which all kind of coalesce together at a, a body called the, uh, the, the Yukon Forum. So this is a legislative meeting four times a year with the chiefs, all of my ministers, uh, it's in-camera conversations. We have very tough conversations. Uh, everything from uh, you know child and family services, uh, for example, all the way through to mining. Uh, this year alone, we uh, we re we changed the uh, family and uh, child and family services act. First time in Yukon history where uh, a, a, a territorial legislation was co-developed uh, with First Nations uh, and the territorial government. And so we'll see more of this happening. Um, you know, in every community, the governments who can do the work most efficiently, those should be the ones uh, that, that do the work and we all can work together, partner, and, and, uh, and it's very exciting times in the Yukon right now. Um, these uh, First Nations are very sophisticated um, and the Yukon Forum has 16 different working groups, a, uh, a, an executive committee uh, that, that kind of coordinates everything together. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of difficult uh, work, and uh, it's great to have uh, these First Nations uh, helping out, uh, lifting, uh, uh, lifting the weight of, yeah, even uh, going through years of COVID. Um, I, I shudder to think what UConn would have, what UConn's experience would have been through COVID if we didn't have those rapports and relationships already developed with the First Nations communities. Um, we all stepped up right away, um, and it was very, very good to see. So. Um, when you take a look at uh, you know self-governing First Nations uh, as they draw down on their self-governing uh, agreements, um, this is really important work. Um, you know we're we're trying to develop more of an equity stake in uh, in everything we do uh, because that's the important piece of living uh, on the land on the traditional territories of the First Nations who who share this land with us. Um, in terms of benefits from mining and um, authority over their own traditional territory. Um, do you, can you tell us a bit about what you would expect the outcome of all of these uh, updates and regulatory processes and, and legislation to be in the end? Yeah, it, it's, it's hard to me to talk about the finalization. We're in the consultation phase right mm -hmm. now with mining uh, and also with the First Nations governments. But, uh, you know, some of this legislation hasn't changed since the gold rush. Um, you know, uh, so making sure that we modernize uh, is a really good opportunity to take a look at historic trends uh, and new opportunities. Um, so whether it be uh, a federal government that's moving towards critical minerals uh, or taking a look at uh, legacy mining and how we can look at best practices based upon, you know, some mistakes that have made, been made in the past. All of this goes forward with the, uh, the creation of new mining legislation or successor legislation uh, in, the, in the Yukon. So it's a, it's a, it's a process. You know, we, uh, we spent a, about a year speaking at the Yukon Forum with the First Nations without mining at the table. Um, you know, really coming together and, and deciding, uh, you know, how we want to move forward together. Um, and in that time, from our first year to now our fifth year, we've seen three mines. Uh, come up and running in, in Yukon and uh, we have another mine uh, you know the, with Newmont uh, you know going through the process right now as well so uh, Alexco reopening uh, in uh, in the Kino district uh, amazing to see that amazing company back up and running uh, the Minto mining at, uh, at Minto uh, again uh, excellent and Minto is a really interesting mine it's uh, on settlement land for the Selkirk First Nation uh, so direct benefits uh, to that First Nation uh, and then you know 
know, watching uh, John McConnell and the team at uh, Victoria Gold open the Eagle Project, uh, the largest gold mine in Yukon history, uh, all uh, under the same time of uh, us working with First Nations to develop an MOU of understand, a memorandum of understanding, uh, and to really start uh, seeding the, the the kind of the groundwork uh, for uh, for the changes to, to mining legislation. So it's exciting times. We're now in that process. The mining community community was very uh, great. Uh, gracious in that time where we were speaking with First Nations governments. Now, you know, we've been working with them to engage and to see how, uh, from a mining perspective as well, how we can uh, get rid of duplication, how we can, uh, you know, take a look at the, some of the parallels and some of the, uh, uh, you know, historic changes to the, uh, the Placer versus the Quartz Mining Act and really now uh, spend some time together uh, modernizing uh, and applying it again to, uh, what, to what the federal government is doing with the critical mineral strategy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the progress your government has made in bringing new infrastructure into mineral-rich areas of the territory? Yeah, we, uh, we started out by making sure that we had a five-year capital plan. That was never there before in the Yukon. So to, to show folks uh, where we're going with uh, taxpayers' money as far as investing, whether it is in tourism or, uh, or uh, sovereignty uh, or in mining, uh, it was really important to show what we're doing each year. Um, from the first year to our last year, uh, the amount of capital projects that are being worked on in Yukon has, uh, has gone through the roof, you know, and uh, our ability to, uh, to, to, in our main budget, say we're going to build this much uh, and then take a look at the public accounts a year and a half later. You know, we've been doing a very good job of committing to and actually, uh, even through the pandemic, uh, getting these projects done. And I hold my hands up to the construction companies in, in Yukon, but also the mining uh, folks as well. Uh, during COVID, uh, we had the best GDP in Canada, and it's in no small part because of uh, miners looking after miners, you know, getting folks back to camp uh, during, you know, you remember that time of uh, in 2020 where folks really didn't know uh, what this pandemic was or where it was leading. Um, you know, we really saw the, uh, the communities uh, pull together. Uh, and so that was great. But um, so when it comes to uh, the actual infrastructure, I mentioned before roads to resources, you know, almost half a billion dollars in investment to roads uh, to access uh, this abundance. Uh, we had expansion of Northern Klondike uh, Highway as well, so that our roads uh, are at the same standard all the way up uh, through to Dawson City, uh, a very rich mining area, uh, which allows trucks to get on the roads earlier in the year. Um, we're uh, announcing major investments in, in bridge uh, replacement. Um, and one of the things, too, uh, when you're looking at um, capital assets in the, in the Yukon, you can't just replace. You have to invest in um, climate change. You have to make sure that the new way that you build, whether it's retrofits to homes and, and businesses or government buildings uh, or even highway technologies uh, or bridge technologies, you know, you're not just replacing, you're making things better. Um, and, you know, we've been very, very uh, lucky to have a good economy uh, to be able to fund. And also uh, with the federal government, we have a really good uh, agreement. Uh, a lot of federal money, like the uh, mining resource roads that I talked about, for example, are a 25-75 split, where our government pays 25 percent and the territorial gov or federal government pays 75 percent. So um, it's been really busy. Uh, even during COVID as well, uh, our GDP is, is humming along and uh, the, uh, the forecasts of our GDP are going through the roof as well uh, as we build uh, and get ready for exciting new projects like Newmont uh, uh, as well, which again, I'm very biased of because it's in my riding of Klondike. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Premier Silver. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.